Dobar dan. Na programu ste Gradskog radija i Gradske televizije i pratite još jedno izdanje emisije Znam da znaš. Ja sam Bojana Dabović, a moj današnji sagovornik, ambasador Austrije u Crnoj gori, gospodin Karl Miller. Ambasador Miller, thank you very much for accepting this interview and taking your time to be the guest of Gradska radija televizija. Pleasure. So, on May 9th, the day of Europe and the day of victory over fascism were celebrated. In what circumstances did Europe mark this day? Well, the celebrations were taking place amidst the backdrop of the ongoing brutal war of aggression against Ukraine. And that has been a predominant feature, uh, and not uh, and quite a depressing one. Uh, it is the biggest challenge uh, to Europe and to the European Union since World War II. Uh, but one also has to look at the upside. Uh, the EU has never become and never been in years as united as it is now. And uh, we were also reminded of that. So it is a day it was truly, that was truly to be celebrated. To what uh, extent did the Russian aggression, and you mentioned it as well, Russian aggression against uh, Ukraine uh, cast a shadow on this year's uh, uh, victory over Fascism Day and Europe Day? Well, the celebrations uh, of both, uh, uh, both uh, events have always been uh, celebrations for peace and for reconciliation in Europe. That's what we were made to think. We were believing, all of us, that uh, war was impossible. That was a thing of the past. Instead of uh, that, we see, and that certainly has marked the celebration to some degree, the return of war, the return of uh, the killing of indiscriminate killing of civilians, the denial of freedom, of identity, and of a, free, uh, of a fearless normal existence, normal life, and uh, also the denial of democracy, the rule of law and of truth. And also, and that's the worst of it, efforts at obliteration of an entire nation. So that is basically the context and that naturally has dampened the fe uh, festive mood. Mm -hmm, of mm -hmm, the celebrations. Mm -hmm. uh, in this context, um, there is often talk about uh, the so-called uh, uh, Russian uh, malignant influence in certain EU member states. How strong is the influence uh, and um, by what means does the West uh, defend itself uh, uh, against Russia's malign malignant influence? In my time in Brussels, which, which is about three, four years back, uh, during the Austrian presidency of the council, uh, I was able to head a few working groups having to do with disinformation, uh, with the systematic willful distortion and lying and manipulation of information. And so I know uh, some uh, details about the uh, dimension and extent of the problem, which has only got worse. It is actually a plague and scourge of our times. And the, 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 this, this information comes from many quarters, not least also from, from Russia. And uh, it is absolutely uh, imperative that we train awareness, that we uh, train media savviness and train people in critical thinking uh, from a very early age. But that's for the for a long haul. That won't work uh, in a short time. In a short time, there are other means and hopefully ever more effective to deal with it. Uh, fact checkers countering this information wherever you can find it, uh, we have become much more efficient at this. Mm -hmm. And uh, is there any success in that so far? So I do think you think that you will gain this battle against uh, Russian malignant I influence in, in, in Europe? I think this, uh, this battle uh, we will we'll always have to be led. Uh, it will never be uh, ended. ended and it will never be won in that way. But uh, we can only be getting better and better at it and also anticipating uh, moves which uh, are directed against the truth but, uh, and, and use the latest technical tools and means 
and we are getting, uh, I think Europe is getting better at that, but uh, we can never say that the, the fight uh, is ended, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In your opinion, opinion, how strong is that Russian uh, malignant uh, influence which we talked about now in Europe, but how strong is it in Western Balkans? And how are the countries um, of this region dealing uh, with this global problem? Because it is not a problem just of Western Balkans and Europe, it's a problem of the whole world. Yes. Um, I think we have we 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 have to work together, and we are getting uh, ever better at it. There are variant various uh, institutions. Uh, they are uh, looking exactly at the malignant influences and discerning them, fighting them. Um, it's difficult to 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 say uh, to to utter about the dimension uh, of the problem. Uh, Compare, but I think they are, we are getting also better at measuring it in various uh, countries and also various countries of the Western Balkans, which probably because they are in a transitional stage, uh, hopefully all towards a very early uh, EU accession, are particularly vulnerable. Also, they are societies in the midst of change, societal change, political changes. So, uh, during a transformation time, I think they are much more vulnerable. and. Uh, the European Union has various programs and, and tools at its disposal, also financially, to help the countries in that respect. And I want also to say that Austria is also participating in that fight. We have had a very serious attack on our foreign ministry, practically a year before there was a cyber attack on um, Montenegro. And uh, so we have also some lessons learned from that experience. It lasted for many months, many months where we actually were not were able to work normally as a foreign ministry uh, in, in some ways. So uh, we, we have some experience and we do our best to help. And also there's the cyber security institution now uh, uh, taking up its work in a short time, I think, uh, which has been uh, set up by Slovenia and, and France with the help of Slovenia and fr France in Podgorica. Mm -hmm. But can you say that the countries in Montenegro, uh, that the institutions uh, and authorities in Montenegro, as well as in other uh, ca uh, region countries, uh, show um, enough will to resist this influence? I think, uh, by and large, uh, they are, uh, the institutions and governments show will to, to counter this information, but uh, naturally there can be weaknesses. Uh, it's difficult to discern weaknesses from, from uh, possible deliberate, uh, deliberate weaknesses, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think everything is practically, everything of that sort is in play. Uh, we can only observe together the situation and also uh, give some counseling and give some advice wherever that advice is taken and sometimes possibly also if it's if it's only reluctantly taken yes so um, in Montenegro we have a government that was voted non-confidence almost nine months ago and uh, the assembly was dissolved. Uh, however, both of these institutions act as if they are in a full mandate. Uh, since uh, the dissolution of the assembly, this institution has passed as many as 14 uh, laws and considered, considered seven more. Um, and some of those uh, were systematic laws which should not have been adopted by the assembly, which doesn't have a full uh, legitimacy. In that context, a large number of Montenegrin uh, lawyers, analysts, uh, above all experts, we should say experts in Montenegro, define this confusing. How does it look to you, the work of these two institutions? Uh, I have looked into this, I've spoken to experts, I've spoken to lawyers and, and also had uh, in-depth contacts with uh, university professors and I wouldn't go as far as to say that uh, there's uh, a different opinion for every person I spoke to, but I have noticed that there are quite divergent opinions, including many which are very critical uh, towards what you have expressed uh, concerning these two institutions. Um, uh, I can only say that, uh, in general, without talking too much about the specifics, because uh, that is a second problem I will shortly talk about, uh, the, 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 uh, the Constitution in Montenegro is lacking in clarity. 
And that has been said to my parliamentary speaker, who was visiting Montenegro by the Montenegrin Speaker of Parliament, Ms. Jurisic, just three, four days ago. Uh, and uh, that is, uh, in fact, something which should be amended. The Constitution was made for a specific set of circumstances, for a spe specific time. Uh, but times have changed and, and uh, the situation has changed, so uh, one might have to look into that. The problem is for the cases you've mentioned, government and, and uh, the, the parliament, where one has to say the parliament is still uh, basically existing. It, it has been dissolved, but the, the deputies and the president of the parliament have legitimately their functions uh, still. The question is more what, what can it do in the present circumstances. And here I think the constitution should be clearer. And uh, unfortunately the, the constitutional court has a big backlog of things to decide on. Uh, I'm f uh, proud to say that Austria and Slovenia our foreign ministers have contributed strongly to the clarification and to the, uh, to the nomination and then appointment of three additional constitutional court judges, which now proves occasionally is not quite enough. There needs to be a seventh judge. But I think some things have improved in that way, and I think one has to go further. Um, uh, in a wider sense, I think there is a big problem uh, with institutions, the stability of institutions, the functionality, the, the enough uh, personnel missing from institutions, which needs to be needs appointing, especially in the field of uh, of um, uh, legal entities. And I think that will have to be addressed urgently as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. That is for sure. And also we need uh, a law on uh, government and a law on parliament and that is something that is uh, not yet uh, been uh, even uh, written or uh, discussed or even passed in parliament. That is true, yeah, and that is one, that, that is part of the the working the the, the list the to do list for for, uh, for the, the next future. period. Mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm. um, until almost three years ago, Montenegro was recognized as a leader uh, in uh, the region when it comes to the European integrations, uh, in specific internal and external political circumstances. Uh, it yeah. uh, became a member of NATO as well. How do you evaluate the results of Montenegro in the past three years? Um, in terms of progress on the EU path? Yes, one has to say that the EU accession negotiation process uh, should and should have been, uh, in those last three years we were speaking of, faster and better. And it is none other than the last uh, progress reports, uh, always uh, issued in October every year, which have made that cl quite clear and have said so, that there's, there's uh, lacking progress. Um, I'm confident that if the politicians in charge are really determined and the circumstances uh, are uh, better than uh, in many ways than they might be now, with very stable government, with stable institutions, with improvements we just talked about constitutionally also, then a small country like Montenegro can make big leaps and huge progress, much faster, much better than bigger countries. So I'm not so worried about the front-runner status that can be regained by Montenegro. Uh, I think there needs to be the four A's, I would say, an appeal, a successful appeal uh, of the government uh, to the population, uh, ambition uh, and, and aspiration and action. And. Uh, I believe, and I've told a few high representatives in politics this uh, lately, that if Montenegro supercharged its accession process, it could be the Luxembourg of the Western Balkans. A small, successful country being a shining light to other Western Balkan countries, being respected, being taken seriously, and I'm quite confident that that can happen. But you don't believe that uh, this, um, let's say, a pause or a uh not uh, going forward on the EU path of Montenegro in the last three years will not jeopardize its path in the future? So far, I would say not. 
uh, but that cannot be could not cannot necessarily be ruled out if if uh, there's 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 a total standstill and absolutely no progress. Uh, this is a window of opportunity. We've spoken about the the, the war for aggression in Ukraine, uh, which has uh, created more positive circumstances for the enlargement discussion, uh, also within Europe. And I think it should be seized by all the Western Balkan countries, especially Montenegro. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the parliamentary elections are scheduled for uh, June uh, 11th. However, there are speculations about the delay uh, of the elections. Prime Minister in technical mandate, Rita Nabazovic, especially insists uh, on this. How do you view the, this possi possibility? Have you discussed about this uh, topic with government officials? Yes, I, I, I want just to say that this is as, as, as everything uh, naturally for, for Montenegro and the people in charge in Montenegro to, to decide. Uh, uh, Austria tries to help, not to, to push or to threaten. Uh, yes, I can say I have discussed that with officials um, and also with experts. Um, I would say, and that is reflecting also what our parliamentary speaker, Mr. Sobotka, has said at the beginning of the week, uh, officially, that it would be better for the country to have clarity sooner. So to have, uh, basically, he had the feeling that it might be better to have these elections done with by uh, the 11th of June. Uh, and uh, I have seen very much, if not to say too much, much political campaigning since I've come. There have been local elections which were then postponed, so there was a continuous role of local elections, then there was uh, the presidential election, the build-up, and now there is a build-up to the parliamentary elections, which is good. Maybe one could say uh, there can never be enough elections in a democratic society, but at one stage one has to come to a phase of implementation, a serious phase, election, pre-election periods are never serious, they are always, uh, there's a lot of over-promising very often, uh, where the phase of uh, implementation follows and, and that in some ways has not happened. And I think the earlier it happens, uh, the better. Uh, but naturally that uh, I hope uh, and I think uh, that uh, a reasonable decision will be or can be taken concerning those at the date of those elections. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe you read some articles about some news of the lists uh, uh, of the new names, younger people who will be on the lists of uh, progressive uh, Montenegrin uh, parties like uh, DPS, SD, SDP. And uh, one fact uh, which we can state today is that the leaders will not be on the list and that they gave space for younger generation. How do you comment? on that? How do you see that? Is that the reform that uh, needed to be done? I think it is, uh, uh, without getting naturally into details with names and so on, I think it is uh, to be welcomed that there is a sort of uh, change and, and, and uh, also even possibly uh, a turnover of elites uh, in, in the parties, within the party uh, head, uh, sort of leading circles. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good thing. Um, I think youth uh, needs a stake, needs a say, a realistic set, uh, say in politics in Montenegro. Uh, the youth has been voting with its feet uh, for far too long. So there seems to be a deficit of politics uh, in favor of youth and giving them possibilities. And maybe younger politicians are more capable to deliver these, uh, these things. So I think it is a, a welcome sign. But uh, youth itself is by no means a panacea. So it doesn't mean that uh, young politicians cannot be, uh, be mistaken in their decisions and that uh, uh, sometimes they, they lack in experience naturally also. Mm -hmm. But I think all over Overall, this is not, not a bad sign. Yes, understood. Um, so we were talking about the uh, possible delay or postponing the uh, parliamentary election. Do you think if that happens, can uh, that uh, destabilize the political situation in Montenegro? Uh, I would be careful in, 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 in saying it, uh, whether it can destabilize the situation. I mm -hmm. think it, it might even make no difference. Uh, it could possibly have some positive effects. Uh, I think earlier clarity uh, would be better, as my president, uh, speaker of the parliament has said. Um, uh, and I uh, also think that 
there should be some 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 uh, uh, rest from political campaigning, uh, and the earlier that 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 happens, the, and the implementation of politics starts with uh, a stable government, the, 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 the better, uh, so that the campaigning issues get uh, get out of the way and and action starts basically. Yes, and the citizens can rest from the elections processes. Uh, so, uh, as we speak about the election process. Um, from local to presidential, uh, all proce election processes here uh, have been held in specific circumstances uh, for the last three years. Uh, here above all, I am uh, referring to the open interference of Serbia and the Bosnian Herzegovinian uh, entity Republika Sr Srpska in the election process and internal political processes in Montenegro. Uh, let me remind you that uh, in uh, the media in Serbia under the control of uh, uh, its president Aleksandar Vucic, during the local elections in Nikšić and Budva, the battle for Nikšić and Budva uh, was officially fought. Uh, additionally, in the report of uh, the uh, observation of the presidential elections, uh, the international observers also noted that the campaign for certain presidential candidates uh, in Montenegro was conducted in, in media in Serbia. Why does the EU uh, uh, react like this um, on this situation and why doesn't it warn Serbia not to interfere in the internal affairs uh, in uh, of a, sover a sovereign country like Montenegro? Uh, undoubtedly, uh, and that it's, it's no, uh, that there's no way of explaining this away, uh, it is a reality that there exists more or less uh, open influence from abroad, also in Montenegro, but Montenegro naturally is not unique in this in this uh, issue. That is clear, um, and uh, that especially things like election financing and and uh, other types of assistance need more scrutiny and more control, uh, probably. Um, what I believe uh, in answering what you are saying uh, is that uh, the EU focus is naturally mainly on uh, developments in its own member states and uh, where it also has the tools and the mechanisms at its disposal to uh, to, uh, to clarify things to 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 if you want uh, to redress things and the authority uh, to sanction uh, things which are not compatible uh, with with what should happen in EU member states um, it is less clear with the Western Balkan countries, naturally, and, and the EU is also not concentrating as much firepower, if you want, on the Western Balkan countries. But I can be, I'm absolutely sure that uh, there is a subtle diplomacy at work uh, in talking to individual representatives uh, of the members uh, of, the, of the Western Balkan countries concerning influencing in neighboring countries uh, and uh, but it is not a good idea to convey such messages via the megaphone and that is why in the public I think the perception is uh, there and has possibly been growing that certain things are happening which are not being sanctioned or talked about or where no redress no no uh, sanctioning is taking place what I believe that this is done uh, basically behind the stage, uh, that it is not done, uh, and, and more effectively so, actually, uh, in a way that is not uh, doing it in public. So you believe the, the EU doesn't I think uh, there is more or less puts blind eye on uh, Vucic actions, it's no, just believe, this dipl I believe, diplomacy? I, I, I believe, yeah, I believe that there is subtle diplomacy at work, like there is also, and the EU could never be an effective operator uh, uh, in, in uh, conflicts you know, and I don't name them, in the vicinity, in the surroundings, uh, which have come to a head recently. Uh, there needs to be a sort of very discreet diplomacy, partly, which where not everything is divulged in, in front of the media and uh, in front of TV stations in order for people to keep their faces, for people to, to keep trying and not to be humiliated. The important thing in such negotiation processes and to keep one's authority as a mediator is always uh, to, to, to not humiliate but to try to convince. And I think that's what the EU is doing, but not 
publicly, so not with the maker film. Mm -hmm. Let's take, uh, let's talk a little bit about the regional initiative uh, Open Balkan, which, of course, Prime Minister and Technical man Mandate Dritana Bazovic uh, is insisting on. Is there a justified fear among uh, certain political uh, structures in this region that uh, this initiative could lead uh, to an essential, if not formal, division of the Western Balkan into the interest zones of Serbia, uh, Albania and Croatia, as stated in the article which uh, has attracted attention uh, attention in the region written by uh, Janusz Bukajski. Yes. Uh, I believe you are familiar with that article. I, I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with that. And I'm, I'm, I'm familiar that this unfortunate uh, influence on politics is, is uh, very much uh, a, a, a topic and trying to take over at the expense of my truly multilateral politics nowadays. Um, I believe that um, Open Balkans might have certain advantages, uh, that it w works fast, that things can be done in a very uh, informal way. Uh, the important thing is to see whether it is fully compatible uh, with EU accession, uh, with the Berlin process and other formats which are uh, taking place and, and uh, in parallel to, to what the Open Balkans tries to do. As with every membership in a club, I would say that there needs to be rational scrutiny and uh, uh, well-researched opinions studied before one takes a decision. There needs to be a rational decision, not a rash decision in such matters, and uh, facts should naturally trump, uh, I would say, emotion and ideology. Uh, so uh, I the decision to take part in various formats of, of converging and, and bringing the Balkans together, the Western Balkans together, should not be taken lightly and should be really uh, on a very serious expert foundation. Uh, and uh, I know that there are skeptical voices, and, and uh, you've mentioned uh, one a particular one, uh, about this, uh, this uh, framework of the open Balkans. Uh, I think also it has to be uh, allowed that what works for one country might not work for another because of the specifics of this other country. What works for big countries might not work so well for small countries and so on. So there have been quite a few opinions also from Montenegrin scientists uh, and, and researchers about uh, the, the, I would say, uh, the, the, how good the open Balkans would work for Montenegro. And I think there needs to be uh, an in-depth discussion and then uh, 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 an informed opinion should be formed and a decision taken. Uh, but it is uh, true that, uh, so I would not say out of hand that I fully agree with all the, the skepticism that it might foster zones of influence, not so quite sure about that. It is said about it, but it should be studied uh, uh, very much on a factual basis. Mm -hmm. And then, there are certain critical arguments which uh, need looking into, certainly. Uh, do you think that, uh, and I understand if you cannot uh, uh, comment this uh, openly, since you are of course a diplomat here in Montenegro, um, the do you think that, um, I will talk about Montenegro, uh, should waste the time and energy into this initiative instead of uh, going to the EU and putting all the resources, uh, people and uh, finance and everything to, to be uh, the part of the EU family as soon as possible? Well, ideally, I think Montenegro should, should uh, have the capability and understand it is a small country and it needs, uh, that, that needs probably enhancing its, its negotiation capabilities and its uh, human resources side of negotiations. But it should be able to, to deal with all these, uh, these various initiatives at the same time. Um, I would not like to enter, because I also am not an expert, uh, into uh, the question, does open Balkans have design flaws or is it designed to have certain flaws in order to achieve mm -hmm. uh, partisan uh, political interest? Uh, I wouldn't venture into that because I'm, I'm really not an expert enough. But it needs to be researched. And, mm -hmm. and okay, uh, so uh, we are approaching uh, to the end of this uh, show and I would like to take a couple of minutes to talk, discuss about media in, 
uh, in uh, media freedoms in Montenegro. Uh, the fact is that Montenegro is in some kind of media occup occupation. Uh, there is a huge number of media owned by tycoons from Serbia who conduct open, great Serbian uh, propaganda. How do you see the media freedom in Montenegro, especially in the context of increased attacks uh, on journalists by the highest state authorities, uh, as well as uh, on the few media that are critical uh, towards the government? Um, yes, I, I would say that uh, we know in Austria one or two things about media concentration and media ownership, foreign media ownership. Uh, we have had uh, this constellation as well. It was not always problematic, but the media concentration is a huge problem uh, also in Austria. And we have some experience also in dealing with, uh, with it. Um, as there is indeed a problem if there is, uh, if, if the media become only voices and loudspeakers for for uh, for opinions which uh, which are not designed to 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 reflect uh, the the variety of opinion inside a country and i think the freedom of the media is a very high priority and essential for democracy and needs the tools and the institutions to control uh, and and uh, operationalize uh, politics which protect media freedom uh, no more protection of journalists is also needed. There have been severe threats to, to journalists, individual journalists in Montenegro, a feature which happens in some other countries as well. And I think uh, there have also been EU warnings about uh, the media situation in its progress reports, which need addressing. So definitely there, is, there are shortcomings of the media, not least possibly in connection with ownership structures. Uh, it's difficult in a small country as it is to diversify the media and have a representative, uh, representative voices heard in the media and to be read. So I think here possibly there need to be better mechanism, better policies. I understand the last government has done, uh, uh, the last two governments have done something in that respect. Uh, ministers have tried quite hard to, to introduce new and prepare new legislation, which is very uh, controversial partly and is still in the works because it takes a long time, but it's better for such a sensitive issue to take longer than to, to, to introduce things which don't work at the end. So this is certainly a building site which uh, I hope will, will uh, improve and we, uh, will uh, yield results in, in, in the short term in Montenegro. Let me ask you one more question for the end, uh, the end of this show. Uh, so, since the, uh, its establishment, uh, Gradska Radio Television Podgorica, which is uh, actually the only electronic media in Montenegro uh, that opens up problems, uh, problematic topics such as uh, corruption, uh, connection with other organized crime uh, at the top of the government, as well as the problems um, of strengthening uh, nationalism and uh, endangering uh, fundamental uh, values, has been a, uh, a constant target of attacks by the highest uh, st uh, state uh, structures and uh, from recently for, from the new authorities in uh, Podgorica. Uh, namely, the assembly of the capital uh, city intended to politically appoint a suitable general director of uh, this uh, media outlet, uh, bypassing the council as an independent body uh, in a manner that is remembered only in the, in, in the one-party communist system. What is your comment on that? Yes, well, I... <laughs> I Luckily, they are not doing this because yes. the, uh, the there was a huge, uh, uh, huge, uh, let me say, yes. 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 yes, yes. No, it's very kind of you to, to mention that. That's what I would have said. Mm -hmm. uh, I've heard news yesterday and I didn't study them in detail, but uh, that the decision was, uh, one decision was retracted. Um, and I... I uh, will understand that the Austrian ambassador don't want to, to enter trench, uh, trench warfare <laughs> between, <Of course. laughs> between the television station and the city government. Uh, but I must say that um, I, I, I want to see the bigger picture in this respect. Mm -hmm. um, I would welcome 
and Austria very much would welcome because that would also reflect uh, in many ways what where the development should go. Any policies, measures, plans and statements in favor of depolitization and meritocratic appointments in crucial state-controlled institutions and the civil service in general. So I'm sp speaking really about the whole of the thing mm -hmm. where I agreed that television stations and media outlets are only a small, a small part in the, in the overall, overall uh, um, situation. Uh, but I think that is meritocracy and uh, not kind of loyalty and allegiance as a main focus, but uh, basically efficiency, uh, professionalism, uh, training and expertise a person brings with him or with her should be the determining factor uh, in all Montenegro to employ and to to uh, adjudicate uh, positions to employ people. And uh, I see and heard encouraging signals uh, lately within the last few days uh, in that direction. Uh, but words are good, actions are better, so one has to wait for the implementation, but that would be welcome. At the same time, one has to say that also in the past, uh, it's, it's not such a, a huge shift that you can say in the past there has not been any meritocracy uh, and now meritocracy starts from, from, uh, from, from this day. That is not true, otherwise Montenegro would never have worked as a state, as it was a functioning uh, state that was taken on by NATO, it was accepted, uh, it basically would be accepted by, by the EU. Uh, serious negotiations are taking place for a long time. So, uh, but the better is the enemy of the, the good. So whatever meritocracy there, there was in the past, it surely can be improved very, very much. And I am I'm, I'm very optimistic and hopeful that this uh, thing will happen because also politicians are helped if they have competent people around them and not just yes-sayers and loyalists. Uh, we know that. We know that from the COVID crisis, you need the experts. You need uh, impeccable experts to deal with specific problems and uh, they need the training and the professionalism. Mm -hmm. Mr. Ambassador, thank you very much for taking your time and for being a uh, guest of uh, Gradska Radio Television. It's been a great pleasure. Thank for, you very much. For me thank the you. same. Thank you. Uvaženi uh, gledalci, poštovani slušalci, pratili ste još jedno izdanje emisije Znam da znaš. Hvala vam na pažnji i želim vam ugodan ostatak dana.